Okay, so my name is David Steele. I work for Crunchy Data Solutions. I'm the uh, senior architect there, uh, which basically gets me involved in a lot of things, backup, uh, patches, um, and, uh, and also, to a large extent, um, auditing. Uh, so this morning we're gonna talk about audit. Um, it specifically, we're gonna talk about an extension uh, called PG Audit uh, for doing auditing, which is, the, I think, now the most capable auditing extension out there. There are various uh, things that you could try. We'll talk about those. And we'll also, is, is the author of Cyan Audit here, by the way? Okay, all right, so yes. So we will talk about, uh, well, I will be talking about auditors um, like Cyan Audit, and we'll compare and contrast a little bit to kind of see why PG Audit is different from Cyan Audit and what each one would be good for, right? So um, they serve slightly different roles, uh, and so depending on your needs, you may you know, pick a different tool, of course. Uh, Oh, there we go. Okay, so here's some boring information about me. And um, <coughs> so let's get right to it. Uh, the, um, so one thing I wanna make very clear is that the PG Audit extension as it stands now uh, was forked off of a project that was done by Second Quadrant, Simon Riggs, Ian Barak, and Abhijit Menon Sen. Uh, and the reason why it, it got forked off of that project was initially trying to get it committed to core. Um, there were a number of changes that we felt was necessary to get it in. So we we're kind of trying to take that project forward. Um, and now the now partly because of that and partly in order to get it implemented correctly, it's become a 9.5 specific extension. Uh, there are features that it used that only exist in 9.5 and up. So uh, so now it's, it's tied directly to 9.5. Um, the PG Audit extension from the second quadrant will still work on versions below 9.5, but it has a lot less capability in terms of what it audits and, and performance and some other things like that. Okay, great. Oh, I don't have the screen. <coughs> Maybe this isn't working. Maybe I could balance these out. What do you think? All right. So, uh, wow, that's a typo. Whoops. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, so anyway, so Crunchy Data and Second Quadrant are working together on PG Audit now to move this project forward into the future um, and give you all the capabilities that you need. So here's what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about you know what is audit logging. Um, I'm guessing that the people in this room have a really good idea or you probably wouldn't be here, but you might just be curious. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about is why, you know, why you're going to audit log. Uh, we'll talk about PG Audit Design, uh, give some practical examples, and then we'll do a short demo, depending on how much time we have left. It may be shorter, it might be a little longer. Um, all right, so, uh, so an audit is an official inspection of an individual or organization's accounts, uh, typically by an independent body. Right, so that, that's an audit. Um, so I wanna kinda make a distinction here between audit and audit logging. So what we're doing is audit logging. Uh, the information gathered by the PostgreSQL audit extension is properly called an audit trail or an audit log. So this is what an auditor would use to determine that all your accounts and all of your stuff is up to snuff and there's no funny business going on. Um, the, uh, so the PG audit extension provides detailed session and or object audit logging by the standard Postgres logging facility. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, the main question I get is, why doesn't it write into the database? Uh, so there are a couple of problems with that, um, and, and we'll talk about those uh, when we get to the, you know, how to audit. Um, so the goal of the extension is to provide Postgres users with the capability to produce audit logs that are required to comply with federal financial um, ISO certifications. Uh, organizations may also have internal requirements that can be satisfied with PG Audit. So you don't necessarily have an external auditor, you're trying to keep track of certain things on your own. Uh, so you can also use it for that. Um, it can also be used for uh, you know, detailed debugging, metrics monitoring, you just wanna see queries that are going through, you wanna capture uh, queries on particular tables. Uh, this can be you know, fairly difficult to do with standard Postgres, but this would make it really easy to say just audit one table. Um, so, uh, 
So that's, that's, that's why you audit. Uh, so let's talk about how. I think that's what most people are interested in here. The thing about audit and audit logging is there really as many use cases there as there are companies or individuals. Uh, so it'd be really difficult for me to stand up here and talk about you know, how you're going to audit from a practical sense because it depends on what country you're from, what government you're dealing with, what ISO certification you're going for, whatever. So we're going to kind of skip all of that and just talk about how to do it. Um, applying it to your particular case would be, of course, up to you. So let's, let's start with the trigger-based solution. Um, so how many people in here have written some kind of trigger-based solution for auditing? Keith, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got three, four, five, okay, so yeah. I've done so too. Um, so the great thing about a uh, trigger-based solution is it's, it, it's quite simple. Um, if you really want to make it uh, you know, complex and robust and have lots of cool features like CyanAudit does, then it takes quite a bit of work. Um, but the, the startup cost is quite small. Right? You can start kind of simply and then make it, oh, now I'll have a function to add a table and do, you know, et cetera. But, uh, one of the biggest weaknesses of the trigger-based solution is it won't audit selects. So, you know, it's, it's a perfectly fine thing to say, well, we just want to audit the modifications to our database, but it's a fairly narrow use case. Um, and if that's enough for you, then a trigger-based auditing system may be exactly what you need. But if you need to do, say, things like selects, uh, then you're going to have a problem because you can't audit those. Uh, the, you can use event triggers. Um, to audit most EDL, but not anything doing with having to do with a role. Roles are global objects, and they don't actually fire event triggers. Uh, and also, the event triggers, uh, uh, event triggers in only just became useful in 9.5. Before that, you actually just got a big parse tree, and there wasn't a lot you could do with that in PLPG SQL. You had to be writing C to, to do anything useful with that. Um, now you can actually pull a certain amount of information out, but you still can't get to the SQL that fired the event. So for auditing purposes, that, that makes it a little bit annoying. Um, <clears throat> another way you can do it, which I've seen, is with functions. So what you do is you write a bunch of functions, and every select, insert, update, delete, everything has to go through a function. And obviously the function can then trivially insert an audit record into a table However, as you can imagine, the maintenance of these functions can become quite burdensome. Uh, so yeah, you'd have to, every time you want to change a query or you've got a new query, you'd have to add a parameter to try to build. It's crazy. And the performance can be you know, pretty miserable uh, using this as well. Um, and then the last one, and believe it or not, this is actually done. <laughs> Does everyone understand what this statement means? Log statement equals all. OK, so basically what this is going to do is it's going to cause Postgres to dump every client command out to the log. Uh, it's, it's pretty scary. Now, the good news is it catches all the client statements. Yay. Uh, but it's very hard to parse. And it'd be very easy to miss nuances. You know, things can come as, uh, you know, do blocks. They could be dynamic SQL. They could be, there's all kinds of things that could come in. And so even though you're getting all of them, it'll be very difficult to figure out what they mean. So you're saying, I want to find uh, a reference to a particular table, right, in a particular schema. But maybe they set the search path and they did, you know, it, it could be very difficult to determine, um, it's surprisingly difficult to, to just search for a particular table uh, in the output. So, and there's no way to filter here. Um, it is the proverbial fire hose. As soon as you set this, you are, your logs are going to get big in a hurry. Um, so, how to audit log with PG Audit, right? Um, so, what PG Audit is an extension. So you you compile, you install it in Postgres like you would any other extension. Um, Crunchy Data, of course, provides packages for major operating systems for PG Audit. Um, <coughs> it gives you a lot more granular logging. So the the first thing you have is uh, you can actually select classes of logging. So say, you know, you're interested in just reads, just writes. Uh, you, want to, you want to see or don't want to see function calls, right? If your function calls are all locked down and you know what they do, then you don't have to audit the functions. They've been audited, and you can just audit the uh, SQL that calls the function, right? Um, or perhaps you're really just interested in uh, modifications to roles or just interested in DDL. 
For instance, I've gone through audits where the auditors were actually primarily just interested in DDL because they wanted to see when the database had been modified and they wanted to, you know, you to prove that you hadn't modified the database in between release windows. So they wanted to see all the modifications during the release window and nothing outside of it. For this particular audit, they weren't concerned about reads or writes at all. We had a separate audit for that. But in this case, they were just looking at DDL. So you could audit just DDL if you want. Um, you know, generally speaking, that's going to be a fairly small audit stream. So uh, there are some advantages to be able to pick. <clears throat> On top of that, uh, PG Audit has object logging. So what you can do is, is create it, uh, some audit roles um, and grant them permissions on tables and basically tell PG Audit uh, only log the things that this role has permissions to see. Uh, and that becomes quite granular because you can do, uh, you can log certain columns or you can not log, log certain columns, certain tables, a collection of tables. Um, and because, because of that, you can also, you know, any of these uh, GUCs can be set at a, um, at a role level. So you could have certain logon roles that have uh, uh, certain audit rules and other logon roles that have other audit rules. Um, if you're thinking that it can get quite complex, then yes, it can get quite complex. Uh, you know, it's best to start with a simpler setup, maybe just with session level logging and then work your way down into object level logging. But the, but the point of all this is to allow you to, to uh, uh, close off that fire hose a little bit, right? Most people don't want to audit everything in their database. Uh, let's say you've got some, you know, very important, say, account tables, and then you've got a, a bunch of large uh, fact tables. You know, you don't want to audit the inserts into the fact tables. That would be crazy town. Um, and you may not even want to audit the selects. You just want to go and see when people were modifying accounts, changing passwords, doing whatever. You can do that in a very targeted fashion. Um, and you can see, you know, all the different statements against those tables, whether it be DDL, select, insert, update, delete. Um, the other nice thing is it's not subject to one problem within database auditors is if the transaction rolls back, uh, you'll lose, you know, the audit information, which is actually fine uh, if you're just auditing modifications. Um, so it wouldn't be good for selects, though, uh, which is one of the reasons why PG Audit operates outside of, um, and it also doesn't try to log into, you know, use your session to log back into the database because audit information could be lost. Uh, we don't want that. We want to make sure that we capture everything. Uh, so the other thing uh, we're able to do is get, <coughs> excuse me, a lot more information. So the log records contain the command, object type, fully qualified object name, um, stack depth. So if you've got functions calling functions, it'll show you how far down the stack you were. Uh, the actual statement, parameters, uh, a couple other things. And of course, we'll be looking at examples of that in a minute. <clears throat> so as I said before, apparently I already have this on the slide. It's implemented as an extension. Uh, uses a whole bunch of hooks into Postgres to figure out what's going on. So there's a hook into the executor, there's a hook into the utility command, there's, there's hooks into various uh, <clears throat> system table load statements. Basically anything we could do to figure out ways to know what's going on uh, internally in Postgres. It's a, it's a little, it, it, it does work. Um, it's a little tricky in some places. It, it's almost like, I don't know, trying to, trying to rewrite a play, if, uh, you know, the script of a play if all you had was the, the playbill. Right? So that's what you've got, and now you've got to like, oh, I need to write the script. So it's, you don't have a lot of information in some places, and we have to put together different pieces of information, but this, the result uh, is incredibly complete. You know, we're able to get a, a lot of information out, and there's only certain areas where we can still audit the event, we can sh still show you the statement, but there are some cases where we're not able to get object names and some other things like that out reliably. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you walk me through this statement one at a time? Just like the whole statement, but how do you know when to audit when to do that? Well, the good thing is um, because I'm, let's, let's take a select, select, insert, update, delete. They're the most complicated, right? Because they've got all kinds of table names and stuff like that. The way, because I'm hooked into the executor, I can actually look at the um, column lists and stuff that the uh, executor has, the table and column lists. So I'm actually able to go through and, and programmatically uh, look at the list of tables that are involved in the query um, or the DML 
uh, and say, okay, well, you want, it, you want to log reads on this table. And then it's triggered, and then it gets logged. So it only gets logged once no matter how many times it hits. In fact, I just take the, whatever the first hit is, then I log it, and then I move on. I don't continue searching, obviously, once I've found a reason to log it. So, <clears throat> and, and you know, if it, if it is a column level uh, permission, then I have to dig down a little deeper and say, okay, well, that table is in the query, um, but now I need to figure out whether, uh, you know, you're reading or writing to it, because remember, updates and selects can be in the same statement. Things can get pretty hairy. So at that point, I need to figure out what exactly you're doing to the table and what exactly you're doing to the column. You know, what's the context? Am I updating this column or am I selecting it? And in a statement, you can be doing both of those things in the same statement. Uh, so it's a matter of kind of walking through those lists and making, you know, figuring out what's going on. Um, and this is why you have, a, you have a lot more information at that level than you would have if you just had the statement, right? If I have the statement, I need to parse it and try to make some sense of it. Postgres has already done that, of course, because it needs to execute it. So by hooking into the executor, you get all that information for free, and, and voila. So, uh, so here's, uh, there are a couple of caveats here, though. Um, it may log statements that eventually raise an exception. So you may actually end up with statements in your log that eventually failed. Now, the good news is you can trace that back, um, and I'll show you a tool that, that we wrote that will actually you know, capture the error figure out what transaction that was in and mark all the statements as errored you know, in, the, in the actual log. Because we have another tool that will take all these logs and push them into a database schema for you if that's, if that's what you're looking for. Um, and then the other thing is it doesn't log statements that contain syntax errors. Because those aren't going to get far enough down uh, for PG Audit to actually see them. They're going to get caught a lot further up and they're going to get kicked out. Um, the good news is though, of course, you're not going to have any leakage there particularly. I mean, there are things a user might be able to figure out about your system by throwing bad queries at it. Um, you know, in theory, what tables exist or, or some other things like that. There's various types of leakage that we've discussed, like things that users can discover about your system just by, by doing weird things. But, um, you know, this would be true even without PG Audit. And now you still will get these statements. So before we had log statement equals all, which is bad because that's the fire hose. But you should definitely have log statement equals error turned on. And if the user's throwing bad statements at your database, they are going to end up in the log, log, log by Postgres. You know, they won't be logged by PG Audit, they won't be seen by PG Audit, but they will end up getting logged by Postgres. Uh, and the same is true for any statements that are attempted while a transaction is in an aborted state. So if you've got an aborted transaction and you keep throwing statements at the database, it's just going to keep throwing errors at you. Uh, those will also go in the log. Um, but they will not be seen by PG Audit. All right, so let's let's look at an example. Um, this is a this is an extremely contrived example, but I wanted to keep it nice and simple and illustrate you know exactly the benefit that something like PG Audit brings to the table over using log statement equals all or or some other simpler mechanism. So so here's our user statement. So the user is uh, building dynamic SQL. And they're creating this table, important table. Um, and this is kind of to illustrate the example of what if a user sets the search path and then does all their queries without schema names? You know, how would you be able to find out uh, what schema that um, table is actually in? Um, and here, of course, no schema is given. Uh, this is using the default search path, so as we know, this table is going to end up in public. Uh, but it could end up someplace else if they had set the search path to something else earlier, and how would we know? So it's important to be able to figure that out. Now here's what gets logged with log statement equals all. Um, so here's the uh, you know, Postgres log and then statement and there. So log statement equals all just parroted back to us uh, exactly what we, we gave to it. Um, yay, but it's not very helpful uh, you know, in, in the case of auditing where we want to go look for very specific things. So here's the same example run through PG Audit instead. So the first thing what we're going to get is, a, is an audit record. Um, this is the session level audit. This is statement number 33. That's what that means. This is the 33, 33rd statement run by this user in this session. It's just a counter. Uh, this one is the, is the first level. So if this function, you know, if this were a function call and that function were to call a function, then you could get down to two or um, even, you know, certain Postgres statements can be recursive. So we, it's a function. 
um, and it's a, a do block. So we're able to figure all those things out just from um, this CSV. Uh, there's no object name. This would actually have to do with the, uh, the object class and the object name, but there's nothing to do here with that because it's a do statement. Um, so we don't have any of that information. Well, it doesn't sound very useful, does it? Because we still don't know what the table is. But luckily, um, PG Audit is going to give us the second audit row. Uh, so it's still a session record, not an object record. Uh, still statement number th 33. Now we're at substatement 2. Uh, and this is where we get to the meat of it. So we've got DDL. That's our, that's our class. Um, it's a create table statement. The object type is table. I mean, that's pretty obvious because it's create table. But um, it's good to be nice and iter uh, specific about these things. And then here's the, the really good part. So now we've got the important table, which here was nicely obfuscated, and we have the fully qualified schema name as well. Um, oh, sorry, quali fully qualified object name with the schema. So, and then, you know, for fun, here's the actual statement that was run, uh, you know, the actual dynamic SQL that was created, and now that is also logged as well. Uh, whereas back here, all Postgres was going to log with log statement equals all was the dynamic SQL, or you know, the construction of the dynamic SQL, but here we actually have the dynamic SQL that was constructed, and a whole bunch of good information to tell us exactly what happened. Yes, they do. Um, so, uh, I unfortunately don't think I have an example of that. There are examples in the regression tests. Um, if you go to the PG Audit project, uh, there's a very large regression suite, and there will be show be examples of uh, parameters. So what it will do is, if there are, uh, see, I think I cheated here a little bit, because normally there would be a comma here, and it would say, we're going to see some examples of this, but basically the parameters would come after. Uh, and I, I think I lost the last comma because what we do is we uh, we don't log it for everything because it would be it would be a lot of if there if there are no parameters it's a big waste to constantly do that and there should actually be a comma here to indicate that there's a null field and I think when I was uh, putting together the slides I I lost the comma off the end but we will see examples of that field later but I'm not sure if I have any parameterized stuff. Um, Anyway, don't be these guys, right? PG Audit makes this stuff easy so that you don't have to, uh, to do this. All right, so, um, so let's look at a demo. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, I like to do that. I, I like to run scripted demos. Um, and if you've been to any of my other talks, I'll, I'll, I have a, a program that I wrote that will actually run the commands, stop at dramatic moments. And uh, so I can make a, a point and, and that kind of thing. Audit's a little tougher to do that with because there's a lot of there are a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, we're we're actually putting statements in one place. Things are coming out on the log, uh, and then we're going to be using in this demo we're going to be using another program called PG Audit Analyze, which will take those statements and and push them into the database. Uh, so it's a little difficult to do that, kind of on one screen and show it. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do um, so these are the uh, this is uh, PG Audit Analyze test. So the, uh, these are the regression tests for the Analyze code, um, as opposed to the regression test suite for the um, PG Audit itself, which is something separate, which uses the standard Postgres expect way of, of you know, doing this type of testing. Uh, whereas this is a little more complicated because it's got to read check logs, move things around. Um, all right, so we're going to run this. So this is actually going to build a Postgres database from scratch and run a bunch of statements through it. Uh, the analyze process is running in the background, and it's going to go and pick up the logs and put them in. So let's, uh, so as you can see here, um, this is where my, my database is actually living in a subdirectory here called test. Uh, this is nice because then you can run as many as you want. You don't conflict with other databases on the system. This is a vagrant VM, as you can see, so I don't actually have any other clusters running on the system, but in theory, um, not everyone's going to run this way. Uh, and we're going to go into PG Log, so right here you can tell we're on CentOS. 
which is not my favorite, but a lot of companies and governments run it. Well, RHEL. All right, let's see here. Okay, there's a lot here. So <laughs> I'm going to do my best to, to do a little highlighting here. All right, so here's our very first audit record. Uh, audit, uh, record. You can see, you know, this is mostly postmaster startup. Uh, you can see connection received up here. Uh, and this is our very first audit record. It was a session level record, uh, is a read, a table read. So we know it's a, you know, read rather than a write um, and select. So you can get, if you, sorry, I actually misspoke earlier when I said that things will get logged once no matter what the logging type, you know, the auditing type is. And that's actually not true. So let's say I'm, I've told PG Audit I want to audit both updates and reads on a table. It will write individual records for that to let me know that that happened. Because the problem is if you just write the read record, if there's an update statement embedded in there, you're in the same problem you were before with log statement equals all. How do I figure out there was an update statement? So it'll actually produce, PG Audit will produce two records, one for the read and one for the write. Um, so you know that both of those operations happened on that same table or that same column. The statement will be the same, of course. But um, although in some cases what we'll do is, and I, unfortunately I'm not sure if there are examples here, but we'll actually re, uh, if it's the same statement ID, you know, this number, in other words, is the same, we won't keep logging the statement over and over again for subsequent, you know, logging information, just to try to keep the logs a little bit more compact. Um, anyway, so this is just telling us that we uh, uh, did read, we selected from this test table. That's it, that was the first test in the regression is just go select from this test table and make sure that I get the information that I need. Um, and then, let's see here. Oh, well, okay, so the reason why I only highlighted that, um, yeah, that's a good point. Let me, let me do that real quickly. But there's a reason why I only highlighted that section. Um, so let's go back here and we'll do, okay. So the part in blue here, uh, this is the part, this is the actual PG audit message that's being emitted. So the, the um, PG audit analyzed software expects your logs to be in CSV format. So you need to be doing CSV logging. It makes the parsing a lot easier. Um, CSV logging also has some better options for kicking things out at certain times and you know, rotation and stuff like that. So it works, it works a lot better. So what we've got, the uh, um, PG audit, audit record is also a CSV record. So what we've got is a, a CSV row embedded in CSV. And that's why you're seeing a lot of double quoting here because all the quotes in the PG audit record have to be double quoted uh, in order to make sure that you, know, you follow your, your proper escaping. Um, and Postgres does all that correctly, of course. So this, starting here, this is the actual log record. So we've got time, you know, the user who was actually, uh, you know, did it, in my case, user one. I've got a couple of test users I create, of course. Um, the database is Postgres. Uh, this is the process ID, I believe. Uh, this is where I'm connecting from. Uh, this, is, this is sort of the uh, Postgres's pseudo unique identifier. Um, it, it's sort of unique, but not completely. I wouldn't trust it. Uh, not sure what that is. Uh, so here, Postgres is also uh, you know, giving us the type of operation that was being done there. Um, this is sort of useful. This is better than log statement all was going to give us. But it's not, it's not the amount of information that you'd like. Uh, and then we've got, um, I believe this is session start time. And this is the transaction ID. Uh, this is the log type, whether it was log, warn, error. Um, I'm not 100% sure what this is, to be honest with you. <laughs> And then we've actually got our message, and then there's some blank stuff. So these, all these commas are Postgres fields, you know, CSV fields that were not filled up by Postgres because they're not applicable to this particular situation. Or some of these I know are error, you know, error conditions. So if there was an error, you get information there. And then finally, at the end, this is, um, I've got the debugging turned way up. So we can actually see where this uh, uh, call was made from. So. Um, which is kind of informative if you want to go look at PG Audit because you can see that this was coming out of uh, the log audit event function, line 743. Cool stuff.
So um, if you like lots and lots of info, uh, CSV format is your friend. It, it dumps everything out by default. You don't have to do all the percent, 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 and then try to format it in some reasonable way. Everything will come out to you, and you've got more information than you often know what to deal with, how to deal with. All right, so let's go and um, let's go if we can get uh, see if we can get some audit records popping out. Yes. I, I do not believe so. Um, I'm, I mean, it's certainly not in the log here. I, I, I don't think that's information that Postgres has any uh, access to. Even if it did, it could be easily spoofed because um, it, it would be impossible for Postgres to verify that. So obviously, it knows the Postgres user, you know, the actual logon account, um, but that's not going to relate to the OS user. And the, they could be on a completely different type of operating system a half a world away. Uh, there's really no way to figure that out. If you're really interested in knowing OS user, then what you need to do is use something like uh, Kerberos for your authentication, right? Then you absolutely will have access to that information through Kerberos. Because uh, as soon as they get their Duque in it and get their ticket, they're going to be passing that information to the Kerberos server. So there are solutions in place to do this sort of thing, and Postgres plays very nicely with them. But Postgres itself is really not, not the place where we want to be doing that kind of thing if possible. There are, there are OS level solutions for that type of problem. Now, the question is, of course, now I've got, you know, I've got that information in Kerberos and I've got this information here. Yes, you'll have to map those uh, together. But the other thing you can do in, in, you know, if you're using Kerberos is you can you know, create usernames that are quite descriptive. You, know, you can actually fix the username to the username, host, organization, something like that, and you can make it so that that really is their OS username. And the only way they can log on to Postgres is by using their OS username. So that's another way you can attack that problem. Yes? Is it possible to set different uh, amounts of log level per user? Yes. So the way this works, uh, we might want to look at the docs too for a minute. But basically, uh, so all of the PG audit settings are GUX. Um, you know, these are, these are the settings that you find in PostgreSQL.conf, uh, and, and most of those can also be set from within Postgres as well. Uh, they can also be set on a role. Maybe, let me think, maybe we should just look at some of the examples in the regression tests. Um, for some reason, I'm not getting, oh, I'm not in the window. I think I am. These are not the droids you think they are. All right, so let's go to Geodit. See if I can find some good examples. Okay, so here's a good example of, so you can, so what, you know, the, the simplest, the most naive way to uh, configure PG audit would be to put, you know, PG audit dot log equals all. So here we've got PG audit dot log equals role. But let's say we were going to put PG audit dot log equals all into uh, the Postgres dot conf, right? And what you're going to end up with if you do that is something is a very like log statement equals all. Now you get a lot more detail. You know, there's a lot more interesting information in there. But essentially, you've opened up that fire hose again. And you know, if you've got a very high volume system, you've got a problem. Um, not so much in terms of performance. You know, we've, we've had, uh, people have done performance testing on PG Audit and found that the overhead is very low, extremely low. But it's still, you still can produce a volume of logs that is truly impressive. So you really don't want to do that if you can help it. So in this particular test, um, so these are the actual regression tests for PG Audit. There's a lot to be learned in here. Um, there's also uh, a documentation, so if you go to the, uh, GitHub site, there's a README, and it walks you through session auditing, um, object auditing, caveats. Uh, it's got the exact format of the CSV records, what you can expect to find in them, all that good stuff. Um, but if you're interested in more of some of the nuts and bolts, the regression tests are good, because I try to go through and, and test every test case that I can think of. Uh, so here, 
This is exactly the example that you were after, oh, sorry, you were after, uh, is that, uh, yes, so you can set the, this role to um, you know, specific permissions to a specific role. Uh, and whenever that user logs on, uh, you know, that role logs on, they would be auditing under those rules. Um, and here you can say, I, I've set, and I've set their log level. Uh, I've done this here, I've set the log level to notice. You would definitely normally not want to do this uh, because then audit messages are gonna start coming out at the user. Um, but it's really nice for debugging. There is also, uh, I put a small patch in 9.6 uh, and figured out a way to make it work in 9.52. So very soon there will be coming to PG Audit a feature to suppress all possibility of audit messages going to the client. Um, so if you're not using a, a libpq based type of thing or you, you know, you've got a web user in between or whatever, you don't really have to worry about it. Your users are never gonna see those sorts of things. But I've just, I've got a branch, um, but we're waiting we're waiting to commit that for some other uh, work that we're doing. We don't want to change the version number while we're doing this other thing. But that will be coming soon. Um, but here I've set it to notice, and then I, what that does is that emits all the uh, audit statements so that uh, the uh, uh, Postgres test code can see them, and then it will compare them to you know, the ideal. Uh, da -da -da, let's see. Let's look at, so, so here's an example of creating um, an auditor role. Uh, and then, Let's, let's find some permissions on that. So let's look at, uh, um, you know, here's a whole bunch of, here's user two with a whole bunch of, uh, in, you know, independent settings. Uh, oh, here's that uh, setting I was telling you about. Um, log statement once. So if you turn that on, if the same statement has multiple hits, it'll only log it the first time it sees it. Uh, and then after that, it'll say, uh, uh, SQL an original you know, statement or something like that. You always know because it'll be substatement one. We'll hold, hold the SQL and all the other statements will, will just refer back to that. It can save a lot of space if, you're, if your statements are quite large. Uh, this is an option though, so it's off by default. Most things are off by default, so the idea is audit as much as possible um, and then you can go in and say, well, I don't wanna see, uh, here's another example here, uh, I don't wanna see uh, catalogs. You know, what's the point of looking at catalog stuff? So you'll still get queries that have user tables and catalog tables, but if the query has entirely catalog tables, it'll exclude it. Uh, this is nice if you're running something like, you know, PSQL, PG Admin, those sorts of things, which are throwing a lot of catalog queries at the database, and you don't necessarily want to see those. Uh, but that's, that's not off by default, it's on by default. So if you don't want to log catalogs, you're gonna go, have to go turn that off. Um, all of these settings are described in detail uh, in the user guide. So you, you don't have to try to like parse through this thing to figure out what these settings mean. They, they're all in the user guide and you can go there to find them. Uh, let's see here. I wanna find an example. Oh, okay, so here we go. So grant select kind of, I think I, hmm, sorry. Uh, grant select kind of up, comma update on table to auditor, right? So this is, this is the part that might take the most getting used to. So essentially what we've done here is repurposed the grant system to allow us to have a sort of audit system, right? Um, if, you, if you look at the audit, uh, audit syntax in other databases, it actually looks a lot like grant. So it's like grant audit on da 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 to, you know, that kind of thing. Because really you're doing, you know, it's, it's a very similar operation. You're saying I want to audit, create an update or select an update on this table. So you do that. Um, unfortunately, here we're not going to see the results of this. So if we want to see the results, we have to go to the output file, which probably I should have done in the first place. It would have made more sense. Oh, that's still the... So now we, the trick is, this is a little, there's a lot more stuff in here obviously, so it's a little harder to find what you're looking for. Okay, so here, so here's where we were on the other page. So now we've, we've just created, uh, select an update on this table to the auditor. Uh, note in this case, the, um, since we had role logging turned on up above, we're actually logging the fact that we granted these permissions. 
Um, you could turn that off, but honestly, role logging is one of the things that everyone wants to see. <laughs> you know, people create a user, drop a user, modify a user's privileges. This is number one thing to audit. Everyone wants to audit this, and you can't do this from within the database, even with event triggers. Uh, so this is the you know, only way to go about it if you want that information. Uh, so then we, so what do we do? We, we go in and select an update. That's not column level, so that's not as interesting. But, let me see, let's look at some. I'm sorry? Okay, so, yeah, let me address this a bit. Yeah, I, I, I'm coming from the perspective of, of, of sort of my own audience experience. Yeah. You know, it's like old value, new value, directly into the custom stuff. Different. Exactly, it is different. Um, so we're, in PG Audit, we're very concerned with what the user did, okay? Not, not the data that they changed, and that's why there's a, a place for more than one type of auditing tool, right? So, uh, so Cyan Audit will actually go through and log all the changes that were made, allow you to revert them, um, you know, do forensics, whatever. For whatever reason you're tracking that information, sometimes it's just nice for debugging. You know, some value changed in the database. When did it change? Uh, you know, who changed it? Not for a blame thing, but just to figure out, you know, when did it happen? And it was, could it have been the cause, you know, source of this change in behavior, the fact that this value changed? That is, that is not what PG Audit does. PG Audit is trying to audit what people are doing in the system. If you have a query that has parameters, is parameterized, those parameters will be passed because they are part of the query. Right? You need to know them possibly to make sense of the query. But you're not going to get, let's say, so his example is good, a bulk update. So let's say I do um, update table set column equals foo where other column equals bar, right? So that's my query. Well, in PG Audit, presumably, you know, presuming I have the audit settings correct, that's all I'm going to see. I'm going to see that one statement. If it was selected, you know, if it has an audit rule that matches, and that's it. So you're not going to see what you're specifically not going to see is, you know, all the rows that were retrieved, and any of the older new values. No. So if you're interested in that type of thing, then what you need is something like Cyan Audit, um, which looks. I have not looked at it, but it looks like a very mature tool. Um, and I am planning to look at it. Um, it, it, it performs a different niche. So I, I think you know, what I wanted to make clear you know, earlier in the talk is you know, there are different tools that do different things. And um, so you can use PG Audit and Sign Audit together. Right? They both do things that the other one does not, and they have specific purposes. Uh, they have some overlap, of course, in theory, uh, but not really. Because for instance, Sign Audit is not actually logging the insert statement that brought the data in. So if you go back in the logs later, you can't find that insert statement. That, that that's, information is not there. But you can find what it inserted, which obviously is extremely valuable and interesting information. But that's not what we're trying to accomplish here. We want to go. We want to know what people looked at, what they modified at, at an object level, not at a row level. That's what that's what these other tools are for. Um, and and you know with those tools, it actually makes sense. You know, PG Audit very specifically doesn't write things back into the database. Uh, from the extension, first of all, configuration can get a little complicated in those cases. Second of all, uh, you know, there's a performance problem. You know, if you're doing a lot of inserts and updates, you can, you can have performance issues. Second of all, uh, if there was a rollback, then the information would not be recorded. And for something like Cyan Audit, that's fine, because it only wants to record the things that are changed. If there's a rollback, it's okay that the audit entries go away as well. But for PG Audit, that's not okay. Um, you know, we don't want people to be able to do a rollback and, and you know, lose all the record of everything they did. Because they could do all kinds of stuff. They could select from a whole, you know, start a transaction, select from a whole bunch of tables, uh, and then issue a rollback, and all the information about those selects would be gone. That's not okay. That's why we don't log that way. But that's why for something like Cyan Audit, it's, it's perfectly reasonable for it to log that way, because you only care about the changes that stick. <laughs> if they didn't stick, then they're not important. So you could definitely use these together uh, or, or separately to accomplish separate, you know, different purposes. I got a little bit uh, derailed from the, the little demonstration I was going to do. Mostly I was just going to noodle around in the database a little bit and poke at some things. We only have a couple of minutes left. So the question is, would, are there questions or would you like me to just kind of
I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay, so PG Audit does not audit uh, authentication failures. Um, however, Postgres does. So we didn't make a great uh, effort to uh, you know, deal with that in PG Audit. In theory, we could have. Uh, but Postgres actually has quite good information about authentication failures. And um, so what the PG Audit Analyze tool does, it actually picks up all that information. Um, and it's able to give you information in the database such as number of connection failures, number of times the users logged on, last time they've logged on. So if you want to, you want that kind of information, you look at the analyze tool, because it's going to parse the Postgres logs, combine that with the audit information in the Postgres logs to give you sort of the big view, the big picture. I, I, I think I want to stress that PG Audit is, is designed to be used under something else. You know, so you're going to be doing log stash, or you're going to be doing, you know, you're, you're, you need some way to analyze these logs. I mean, you can't just like throw them out. I mean, okay, yes, you could just grep them, so the ultimate case is, yeah, well, yeah, I'll just grep it when I need the information. Okay, well, that's, that's true, and you could do that, but the problem is it's, it's, you want the information in a more queryable form. And what we've found so far is that it seems like every organization that's using this wants to deal with the information in a completely different way. So while we had thought initially of uh, putting you know, different logging types and other things into PG Audit, We've sort of discovered over time that's a losing game because everyone wants something completely different. And trying to code that all into the extension, probably a mistake. There's lots of established ways to deal with log files and push things around. And so, and PG Auto Analyze is just one of those ways. Um, it's more of a reference program to kind of show you, here's how you can take this information and make something clean and nice and queryable about, out of it, rather than an implementation that you might take uh, to your company and just run bare. Yes? It would, log by, it would be logged by Postgres under log statement equals error, right? So if it doesn't get through parsing, uh, my hooks are at executor start. So if it doesn't get to executor start, then I'm not going to see it, yes. But it will show up in the log as an error just as it would now. Um, I think my time's up, so thank you very much.